that part. Okay, good. So I'm now trying to go full screen here. Uh, just uh, can any somebody quickly confirm that that works? Work. Yes, it works. works. Perfect. Thank you. So. Um, just uh, upfront, uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, and I'm, I have uh, it's quite a, a lot of slides, and I will afterwards share the link to this slide so you can have a detailed look. It's really uh, I try to tell a story around why Sila, what we did, uh, why Animal, what how it goes together, and why it's needed, etc. In the industry, and I will go through that really fast and uh, bear with me if it's too fast for some of you but as I said it will be available and we will have a general breakout session for these type of questions uh, afterwards so it's about an introduction to Sila the history and why Sila 2 uh, it is a bit about of a history about okay lab automation today where we where is the industry where should it go etc uh, etc et regarding digitalization and true integration then it's a bit of background about sila uh, concepts and technical background and then i will not go into other standardization organizations but it's just for the sake of completeness there is also a few slides that compare uh, sila for instance to opc and to other uh, things that uh, you can see here okay now um, sila at the very short uh, uh, like glance uh, SILA uh, actually is a standardization organization. It's a global non-profit organization which aims to create uh, international standards to create open connectivity for a digitalized lab. Um, there is core and supporting members who uh, pay for its operations and uh, we also need to have some budget for advertising, etc. But everything that the SILA organization creates or the community creates around SILA is provided free of charge with no uh, licenses. And one of the goals is definitely to have a low total cost of ownership for all stakeholders when you use SILA in uh, digitalization projects. So no licenses, no uh, royalties uh, of the standards. Now the vision, I said that uh, just before, um, uh, really enable open connectivity based on existing standards. I think this is important to know. Uh, SILA organization has no aim to implement yet another like connector, physical connector or whatsoever. So the idea was really based on existing industry proven things and put that uh, necessary, let's say, life science layer on top of that. It should be extremely accessible, straightforward. Uh, stable, but also should be extensible. So if, if, a, if a vendor or you and your project or a implementer uses SILA, it should be very easy to, uh, to extend it. By the way, what I say here is very true as well to the uh, analytical instrument markup language, NEML. And we just, uh, you've seen, we included a, a breakout room for uh, NEML, even though the uh, hackathon was initially only announced as a SILA hackathon, but these things go just so well together and seal and animal are partners for a long uh, time already and then of course uh, to continue in the seal vision uh, slide of course uh, it's a lot about also improving data integrity by applying these standards and also make lab automation more cost effective and just remember uh, if, if 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 i speak for instance about lab automation uh, it's not necessary robots are meant, right? Lab automation can be robots, but it can also just be la automating lab data flow uh, and generally connectivity between uh, systems. So don't get, don't get uh, confused here. Um, we're not going into uh, more details of accessibility and outstanding concepts. You will see more of that in uh, the breakout rooms. But the last bullet point community process, I think, is one very important aspect. Uh, the SEAL organization managed to create a living, growing community around the SEAL standard. And we believe this is one of the vital aspects to make a standard successful. The standard needs to be adopted. And adoption happens if people believe in it and if people support it. And if the standard is used and it lives. And I think this is one of the main differences uh, if you compare now the new SEAL 2 standard to the uh, former SILA 1 standards. For those of you who have been with SILA for a longer time, maybe they, they still know that there was a SILA 1 in the past. And uh, many, maybe people may, might think that SILA 1 was a failure because of the technical choice, but uh, we strongly believe that SILA uh, um, 2 is actually 
a success because of the community process. And of course, also the technology choice is important, but the community process is much more important to make, to make that whole uh, thing fly. Okay, um, yeah, this is a bit of history. You can look at that yourself or ask that in the channel session if you're interested. I don't want to uh, lose a lot of time here. Just maybe so much, about five years ago, a, a group of really fascinated people in the standardization corner uh, started to think about, hey, we have to do something uh, uh, which is different. And this is where Silo 2 has been born. And then from there, uh, we have been uh, developing uh, two the status where we are today and we are really able to grow a fascinating uh, community uh, over that time. Now, what makes this a TILA 2 different? What makes it different, for instance, to uh, previous approaches or, or previous standardization approaches? You will see that in, uh, in the part of this presentation, I think. Uh, it's a lot about uh, being modular, flexible, extensible, service-oriented designs so or try to, to apply modern like architectural techniques and uh, but base also base open open existing standards and technologies and and and, and combine that with intelligent and elegant concepts i think this was the, the, the were the main ingredients and uh, and then uh, maybe if you look more from a technical perspective there is a slide also at the very end where we compare different standards uh, you might also think yeah why don't we use a fancy iot thing like mqtt or whatever and we have a clear opinion about that. I mean, technically, SILA is not much a way of that, but it's not the technical aspect. It's really that life science aspect. You know, most of these IoT standards don't go beyond switch on, switch off, uh, or light on, light off, or maybe temperature value uh, complexity level. And you can imagine in a lab, you have way more complex systems. If you talk about the limbs, an electronic lab notebook, or a chromatography data system, spectroscopy, they're way more complex systems with way more complex data. And that therefore these IoT standards usually don't really work. That was definitely one of, one of the rationals. Now, if you look into, into labs today, um, today you usually have a very heterogeneous setup in many of the labs. Things are not connected, islands, islands of software, of vendor-specific software, etc. And wouldn't it be ideal if all these things could talk to each other, if, if in a like microservice kind of framework, these things could actually find each other, talk to each other, etc. So um, in the end, in an ideal digital transformed lab, there would be no manual data, transcription, no paper, no USB sticks, etc. And of course, and a very important point, your data would be fair, findable, interoperable, accessible, reusable. And I think Burkhardt will talk about fair and all these concepts in his, uh, uh, together with Robert, in the animal breakout for sure. Okay, now uh, if you look into today's labs also, just to get, show two typical, typical approaches how, how you integrate today. So there is usually the way of, okay, trying to share files between systems, like you have a laboratory information management systems that drops a file somewhere and an instrument picks it up and, and puts back a result. And there is many problems associated with that. It's, it starts with proprietary file formats, access permissions, race conditions uh, on the file system, and, 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 and there is many issues with that. This is one thing which is still predominantly done in labs. And another thing is you have very old protocols like RS-232 protocol, which are, uh, I mean, uh, if you compare it to SILA, it's actually not really comparable from, from an abstraction layer where, where, where you actually, where, where you are. And there is also a, a lot of difficulties with these pro, pro, uh, protocols. Um, uh, of course, in big systems, it's difficult to maintain, but usually it starts also when implementing that the specifications are not clear, that the time behavior is not clear. There is loads of problems associated with that. And those of you who already implemented uh, drivers for serial devices and stuff, they, can, uh, they know what I'm talking about. So today, then is something else, you know? As of 2007, with the introduction of the iPhone, uh, 
people started to see what is possible. People started to see what is possible in other industries, in consumer electronics. And people start to ask questions. Why is this not happening in the lab? Why can I use um, just my Bluetooth headset of any vendor and just connect that to my hardware, device, tablet, whatever, of any vendor, and it just works? Why does it work? So people also today expect seamless integration. And this is another rational, of, co of course, for the, for the, for the, for the SILA standard. So as a conclusion, uh, the true integration is needed to digitalize your lab. So you need to have means to describe capabilities among systems and devices and instruments. You need to have ways to find the different systems in a network maybe. And then you also need to be able to orchestrate, command, use these different services. You need to be able to ask a balance about not only the weight, but maybe also about meta information, about the, who, who, which user, which sample, etc. So standards are ultimately required to digitalize your lab. And this is, I think, the whole rationale between, behind SILA and ANIMAL, right? And standardization in other areas, micro data plates as an example, or, or container logistics as an example, is just common, you know? And, but in, in, if you talk about connectivity standards or data standards, they're so abstract that they're so not tangible that people are kind of lost and don't see actually the benefit. I mean, here for the, for the container logistics and these type of things or my MTPs, for everybody it's kind of obvious why, why these standards help, right? But it's not so obvious uh, on, the, on the more abstract uh, layer of, um, of software or data standards. Now, this is also a, a, a fancy topic uh, of myself. I mean, why is it so easy to share music, but why is it so difficult to just uh, uh, read and understand the, the, the spectrum uh, of my colleague's uh, lab because I don't have the software for the spectrum either. Uh, and so this is also uh, a driver. Right. So as a consequence, the integration requires, in our opinion, communication standards and data standards. And uh, for the communication layer, uh, we talk about SILA. SILA is really that communication standard to make lab systems interoperable but once you communicate to a system just imagine you talk to a spectrophotometer you get back the spectrum you have to interpret that spectrum and this is where animal comes into place animal is taking the data part and the data standardization so animal and celio you see here just go together very well and as i said initially the organization share very similar uh, models uh, of uh, licensing and openness and that we believe that this is a vital part. Of it. Now we're coming to the SILA concepts and technical background. Uh, I've seen that some of you know basics about SILA, some of you maybe have even worked with SILA, but for me it's always in important that you understand at least the basic concepts of SILA and don't only look into the reference implementation and take the reference implementation as a standard because the standard is actually the standardization specification and the reference implementation is just a way of implementing it, but it's not the truth. And it's important to understand the concepts, I believe, to, to get on faster also with the reference implementations. Now, in principle, SILA is very, very simple. You do have a, a server and a client component. So we have a kind of a provider and a consumer component. It's much like you have a web server and your browser, right? It's the very same uh, semantic and also, uh, let's say, operational model, right? And it's the same type of loose coupling. Just imagine if you browse a website, if you as a client decide to shut down your client, if you have a bad network connection, etc. I mean, the server usually doesn't care and, uh, or doesn't know even. And hence, the SILA specification is done in the same way. The SILA specification only specifies how the server has to behave. And for the client, there is very, very minimal obligations, right? It's all in the responsibility of the server uh, to, uh, to actually uh, uh, make the whole ecosystem uh, um, stable. Now, um, just maybe in a, in a, in, in, in a brackets, um, maybe some of you have seen that we are working on a SILA cloud connectivity use case. Um, and uh, the cloud connectivity use case uh, is basically uh, uh, extending the current SILA concept in a way that the, the, the connection can be established. So in, this, in the current standard, it's always the client 
that connects and establishes the connection to the server, right? And if the connection is broken, it's always the client which reconnects. And that's this new cloud uh, uh, reverse connectivity RFP. Uh, the goal is to also extend the CILA specification in a way that the CILA server can connect to the CILA client and establish a secure connectivity channel. Just think about the, a use case where your client sits in the cloud, in a public cloud, and your CILA server, your instrument, sits in a in a private um, uh, network, and so uh, this is necessary. But this is just a, in, in in brackets, and maybe we can discuss that in the general in the general breakout room if you're interested to hear more about that. Now, um, if you look at it in the, in a real world uh, context context then your CILA client would maybe be a laboratory information management system, a LIMS. The LIMS would perform a CILA discovery to find out, hey, what is here? What, what, what do we have? And the different uh, CILA servers, and this can be software systems or this can be physical devices, the different system, systems would respond with, okay, here I am. And uh, the LIMS would therefore know what uh, is available in the network. And now the CILA discovery goes uh, further. The CILA discovery also allows to uh, basically the CILA servers or the services to describe themselves. And we call that features. A feature is basically a service description. And the feature concept, I think, is a very important concept. And the feature concept is also the one concept that distinguishes and, and, and makes basically CILA very unique if you compare that to IoT standards, right? The feature concept is extremely uh, important. And, but for you, in a nutshell, features basically are a set of capabilities and interaction possibilities for a specific service. And uh, there is a few design constraints that are maybe important to know. Uh, features should be implemented as stateless as possible. There should not be any inter-feature dependencies if possible. Uh, there are some exceptions, of course. Uh, and, um, but it's very vital uh, that, that uh, basically you do a proper feature design. And there is a, a lot uh, about uh, features uh, uh, that are important in the standards. We come to that. Uh, uh, later on, or you also have the chance, of course, to, to, to uh, during the day um, to learn more. Now, once uh, the feature has been basically published, uh, the LIMS actually knows, for instance, in this context, what the counterparts can do, and it can start. It can actually start working with with uh, with these uh, devices. Just as an example here, an illustration, a balance. Uh, in this example, provides five different services. Uh, the CILA service is a service you always have to, or, or a feature you always have to present. But it also has a weighing service, calibration service, monitoring, and qualification service that the balance is offering. And um, you can also see in this example, uh, the weighing and calibration service, for instance, can be standardized features, and uh, the monitoring or qualification service could be a vendor-specific feature even. And uh, it actually doesn't really matter whether the, the features are standardized or vendor-specific uh, to be able to, to interact. But of course, if it's a standardized feature, you probably have more possibilities to interact in a, in a nicer way, in a user, more user-friendly way in the end with your instrument. But this is just illustrating uh, the concept. And this is very similar if you would, would basically look at the features that a HPLC CLA server would expose, right? It would expose method management, sequence submission, et cetera, which where you could deal with uh, the actual chromatograms, et cetera. So but this is just as an illustration. And now you can start combining these different things in various ways. CLA is not pushing you into a specific application model. You can do peer-to-peer, master-slave, you can do what any, any kind of uh, uh, operation uh, uh, between CILA server and, and, and CILA client. Uh, this is really not dictated by the standard. This is uh, intentionally left um, very, very open. Now, uh, you can also uh, swap the roles. You could also imagine that you have CILA clients in your lab, like that you have a balance or barcode scanners in your lab, and these clients would call uh, a LIMS or a laboratory execution system CILA server for information. So the scanner scans a sample, the scanner would then ask the LES, hey, give me 
the, the tasks that are required for this sample and the limbs will provide the, the tasks and the specification, etc., to the balance. And the balance would then uh, present to the user what he has to do maybe on the display of the balance and would guide the user through it. And the, in that context, the roles have been swapped and the Scylla client is the balance and it's not a Scylla server. But you could also imagine that the LES is controlling the balance and hence the LES would be a client and the balance a server. Scylla does not dictate that to you and depending on your use case or workflow, one or the other makes more sense or you can even have both at the same time. There is no uh, restrictions whatsoever in that perspective. So this is basically a slide illustrating that you could be both a client and the server or both at the same time. Now, Regarding the technical specification of SILA, you probably all have seen the SILA part A, part B, and uh, the part C, which is actually going to be obsolete and uh, be actually uh, part of the Git, uh, GitLab repository, SILA base. Uh, why has that done that way? Why is there a core and a mapping specification? And why are the features on top? So there are several reasons for that. First of all, we wanted to have a technology and implementation agnostic overview and concepts at the feature framework is totally implementation or technology agnostic. And that's, I think, very important because we chose in part B, we chose a technical way of how to implement Scylla. And it could be that this technical way maybe is obsolete in a decade or in 20 years, who, who knows? And so we wanted to be able to uh, be future proof and to be able to also have maybe different hardware implementation layers uh, to implement the same uh, standard. Um, I will come to some technical details in a minute and, and just tell you why we chose what we chose. And then on, but on top of that, so the, the, basically the yellow part is a very stable core, but we need to have something which allows for flexibility and evolution and extension of the standard. You know, if, if, if you are a vendor and you have your fancy new instrument and you want to use the SILA standard to expose services, features uh, from your device, and if you, you have to wait for a standardization organization to standardize your specific fancy feature, right, this would be uh, just hindering your time to market and then and, and slow, slow, slow down your time to market and hindering evolution or uh, innovation. And therefore, the feature framework really is that part that allows flexibility. And inside the feature framework, there is even more possibilities. I'll, I'll have a slide on that uh, later on. And I'm soon at, at the end here of the first introduction, but just to give you uh, the concept. This is just uh, a slide to read for you again. Uh, to, uh, in, in some words of what I said about the specification concepts, right? And now a few words about the feature framework. As I said, features basically describe the services. Now the nice thing with features, they are kind of an ontology or taxonomy of your interaction models with uh, the um, instruments. And the nice thing with features are also features are human readable and machine readable. There is a so-called feature definition language that is used to design features. And it has been created in a way that the product manager or a non-technical guy can actually write feature definitions. But at the same time, a technical guy or even an, an, a, a computer can actually read, understand, interpret, and work with the feature definitions at the same time. So in the end, in a nutshell, a feature is kind of a functional specification of a interface in a human and machine readable way in a standardized way. And this is, by the way, very, very similar to uh, the technique definitions of, uh, of the animal standard. There is a lot of parallels and we believe, and it has been proven that I think this is true, that this is one of the central or core ideas. Now, features, of course, do have version history. Fe features can be in a certain maturity state status so they can be standardized they can just be uh, like drafts uh, proprietary uh, in your namespace right but they can also be in an open uh, standardized SILA namespace for those features who have wider use for those features who prove to be uh, having like a common use case etc uh, one example of such a feature could be the authentication or authorization feature features that are used to actually authorize or authenticate users or systems to actually use the SILA standard for communication, just as an example. Now, 
Uh, I don't go into that detail uh, in the standard. There is a specific maintenance uh, uh, like diagram for, for features. Um, reference implementation you see as well uh, afterwards. I don't go into that. Uh, I just wanted to summary quick uh, or do a quick technical and a quick um, conceptual summary here for you to conclude. So again, on the technical side, Zilla actually is nothing else than a microservice architecture suitable for life science automation in a lab. It bases on HTTP2 uh, and also uh, prot protocol buffers as a payload. Protocol buffers is kind of a binary, uh, very efficient, very performant JSON type safe. And uh, uh, the, the, one of the reasons for choosing protobuf was definitely the type safeness and, uh, and the, 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 the availability of a clear schema, let's say. And why did we use HTTP2? Uh, I don't know who familiar you are, how familiar you are with that, uh, but in the end, there were two reasons. So one was HTTP1, uh, or actually HTTP1.1 was, I think, released in 1999, and now it actually survived 20 years. And we believe that HTTP2 as the successor will again survive two decades. And this is one of the reasons why we chose that. And the other thing is, you all know RESTful web services based on HTTP1 uh, make very inefficient use of TCP connections by actually opening connections, sending a request, getting a request, closing the connection. Whereas HTTP2 makes a much more efficient use of the uh, TCP connection by actually allowing parallel non-blocking streaming inside one TCP connection. I think this is technically uh, were the reasons why we, why we chose that. And then I mentioned that the feature definition language, this happens to be an XML dialect. I mean, could be done differently, but if we just chose XML because there is a wide support of uh, tools, etc. But as I said, initially feature definition language is human and machine readable. There is Scylla data types on top of that because Scylla is very, very type safe. Uh, the discovery mechanisms are important. Some of these discovery mechanisms for the server discovery based on zero config, which is a widely used uh, standard. Maybe just as an outlook for you for the future, uh, on our roadmap of uh, the Scylla standard, there is also the idea of implementing a, a, a different, more global discovery mechanism, maybe based on distributed hash tables, etc. But also here, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We also want to learn from the other IoT uh, standards and, and, and initiatives out there. But this currently, the discovery basis on the zero config, which is a multicast DNS and DNS service discovery mechanism. Okay, and from a Conceptual st uh, standpoint, um, we do have a, a, a stable SILA core, which uh, ensures proper interoperability also into the future if versions change. Uh, SILA speaks science with the support of the physical units, with actually uh, the alliance with NEML uh, for uh, analytical instrument data. And the features themselves allow flexibility in terms of evolution and extensibility. The feature definition language is a glue between the worlds, between the scientific and more the technical world, and it replaces a, sp a functional spec, but in a standardized format. And the feature discovery to just allow universal interoperability and the discovery in general, allowing a great user experience for the end user in the lab. Okay, so I think this is uh, all I wanted to cover, I, I think we don't have time uh, and I don't want to spoil you here and, and to go into the uh, uh, other organizations and standards organizations, too, too boring for you, I guess. But as I said, there will be a general breakout where we can have such a discussion and the, the slides will be shared right, right, right away. So uh, I think we do have uh, five minutes now to uh, separate into different breakout rooms. So for those who have not yet replied to the Google form, uh, please uh, do that. Um, and uh, so that we know in which breakout room you wanna go. And we also have time now, uh, maybe while I put people into different breakout rooms, uh, time for, uh, for quick questions or additions. I don't know uh, any of the folks from the breakout room moderators poor card, low cuts, et cetera, just uh, see you quick, oh, at the top of the list um, if you want to add uh, anything or, or answer questions. Otherwise I start splitting up into breakout rooms now.
yeah, happy to answer.